Um, welcome friends, family, faculty, staff, and the graduates of the 2019 class of the Edmund Burke School. My name is Mustafa Mizrahi. I have had the privilege of being the 12th grade dean for this year. We're here to celebrate an important milestone in the lives of 51 young people close to the hearts of everyone gathered today. Seniors, I know the journey through high school has at times been difficult. Sometimes it's been tedious. Occasionally it's been stressful. But it's time to put aside those thoughts and feelings. Today you can take pride in the fact that all of that is in the past, and now you can all finally get to work on those bright, exciting futures you've been preparing for. As part of the celebration of your accomplishments, the ceremony today will include six student speakers and two student performances. You will also hear from Head of School, Damian Jones, as well as our keynote speaker, Daniel Running. Unique from any other schools. 
Because at Burke, we didn't just have classes and lunches. We had intense personal connections with each other. In a classroom setting, we had heated debates over takeout and Starbucks. <laughs> we talked politics and we talked about mental health. We learned the difference between listening and engaging. We had teachers who didn't just teach us to get through curriculums, but taught us to get through life. They taught us how to problem solve and produce solutions to complexities that we could have never thought existed. They taught us to be brave and fight for what we believe in. They showed us what it means to be spirited and diligent. They, they taught us to be ourselves. They made it clear that no matter where we come from, who we love or who we choose to be, what our strengths and weaknesses are, how we choose to live our lives after birth, no matter who we are, we were born to be great, and we can do anything we put our minds to. Because of this, we have all excelled. We have all blossomed. We have all made it this far, and this is nowhere near the end. As for our fellow graduates, how excited are we to walk across the stage? So long, and though our dream of graduation is finally coming true, it comes with a price. We will never sit like this again, all together in one place. Some of us may never see each other again. We'll go on into the abyss and carry on with our days without the comfort of one another. We'll make new friends, new memories, and new homes. And that's what we're supposed to do, because Burke taught us that change is a good thing, growth is necessary, and growing up is inevitable. But we cannot forget where we came from. We cannot forget the memories we shared together in the atrium, on Founders Day, at pet rallies, at sports events, and theater performances, patching, passing each other in the halls, and every little rewarding moment. And if you ever feel too far from home, remember that we're all just a phone call away. Our emails may not end with at workschool.org now, but you can always reach us. There can never be a moment when we're not there for one another. There can never be a moment where we allow ourselves to lose sight of who we are. The people we are today are only a fraction of who we will be in our futures, and we must always remember what we value. We must always remind ourselves where we came from and what matters to us, because if we don't, all of this would have been for nothing. We must stay true to ourselves. As Kanye would say, keep that same energy. And don't be afraid to take risks. Don't forget to take care of yourself. Don't forget about us and what we've shared with one another about throughout these years. Don't forget that you have a forever friend in all of us. Now, for the very last time, I'm Sydney. I'm Nyla. And we thank you for the past four years. Good afternoon, families, friends, faculties, and the class of 2019. My name is Kanye Wen. As a student transferred to Burke as a 10th grader, everyone in the school has done so much for me. But it still took me longer car to stand here and speak. Burke has been a comfortable bubble for me because it's such a warm community full of supportive students and teachers. But at the same time, as it pushed me out of my comfort zone to try new things all the time. Burke is a college preparatory school, but to me, it's the school that taught me how to perform as a person. Speaking out and arguing with my own ideas is the first lesson that Burke taught me. Growing up in a culture which is greatly influenced by Confucianism, I follow doctrine of compliance and never argue with others. I was called a good kid because I was lessened. However, at one point, I found myself starting to lose my own goal and forget what I truly wanted. I would always remember how I did my first English debate on state class on the topic of whether there's universal good. In that class, I realized I can stand and speak up what is on my mind. Thanks to all the debate challenges we've given throughout the three years, and my philosophy class we stand on my senior year. I learned that I do enjoy the feeling of being listened to and agree with, because only one person is listened is respected. Gradually, I transformed myself out of being a girl who would always agree with other people's idea. I learned how to argue stand out and speak for myself. Having tasted the sweetness of speaking out, I started to ponder how to turn it into actions. Hence, my participation in softball, a sport which many people have against as they thought is competent for me and too fragile for that. Yet with my constant efforts, <coughs> I proved myself and became a starter first baseman on the team. When I first got into work, 
I was amazed how talented all my classmates are. Not only a camping field, but also in sports, arts, and music. Seeing all the well-wanted musicians like Ian, I had a strong willingness of becoming one of them. But at the same time, I started to regret why I didn't learn any jazz in the past. Before I came to work, I had always been thinking about what I couldn't do and regretting what I didn't do. I always felt regret about not doing sports in China, regret about not being more open to strangers. I believe my shyness to new people is always the number one barrier in front of me whenever I try to make friends. I was feeling regretful every day. Regretting why I never told my peers that I appreciate them. Regretting why I never told them how I thought. There was even one moment I thought I would just move on to college without any members of high school. Here comes the turning point of my life. The musical. Playing for the musical gave me a reason to work with the musicians I had always wanted to work with. It is always a stressful but enjoyable thing working with people who are full of talent and passion. This is how I feel every day at work. I was enjoying all the challenges I was given daily, which could lead to self-improvement. But at the same time, I had to keep work, working very hard, so I won't be left behind while everyone else is moving forward. It is true that your past has an effect on your present lifestyle. But how you plan your future depends 90% on your present action. There is no concept of being too late. Because, and because your uh, present is the past of the future, which should be as, pres as precious as the past of the present. It's never too late. And the best time to start one thing is not past, not future, but now. This is the second lesson of Brick Talk Play. The single traction of life will never slow down or stop for anyone. But it's because of the non-returnable aspect of life, every moment becomes more precious. We are certain to make decisions that we may regret in the future. But the chance of regretting should never, ever influence our passion for life and for our goals. I will not wish that because of 2019, we will always make the best decision in the future. Because it's impossible. Instead, I would like to wish all of us will always be grateful to what we own and never be trapped by regrets. Thank you. Good afternoon, parents, friends, faculty, staff, and the class of 2019. Thank you all for sharing such a wonderful afternoon with us. I'm here today to uh, graduate, <laughs> but I also want to share something special that this school has given me, confidence. So confidence is a really funny thing. It ebbs and flows depending on just about every situation. Even in some of those bold and charismatic people I know, there are still times when their confidence dwindles. It usually happens when I'm surrounded by unfamiliar people, unfamiliar things, and unfamiliar experiences. <laughs> kind of like this one. <laughs> so, I'm five foot seven. And I'm sure it's hard to believe, but for most of New High School, I was even shorter than that. <laughs> and in my 17 years on this planet, there are a few things that I consider to be constants when you literally live below everyone else. Number one. Neck pain can be a serious issue. <laughs> Just as a function of always having to look up to address people. It's actually been a real blessing for my neck to have my six foot two brother be away at college for the past few months. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, getting people's attention at all, much less having to look up to talk to them, can be an immense challenge. I actually think that mastering the outside voice is essential for those who lack height. Play sports, be a middle schooler, be Mustafa. Strive to live a life where being loud is not only acceptable, but necessary. It's going to seriously help. But lastly, being short can make it difficult to be confident. My height has challenged me in any number of, way, uh, any number of ways, from trying to raise my hand above others in class, to performing and leading in athletics, to moving boldly through the world. But in my seven years at Burke, my confidence has certainly grown. In middle school, it was a given the class size would be small. I think there were 18 kids in my sixth grade class, but it wasn't until high school that I began to really appreciate that. I quickly learned that if I had a stupid question, I could ask it, no matter what. I knew that worst case scenario, only 15 other kids would hear the question. So I, <laughs> <laughs> so I felt like I had the liberty to ask what I didn't know, to actively seek help if I needed it, no matter how easy the concept. 
Then came sports, something that taught me not only how to lead, but also how to be led. Burke made that possible too. Freshman year, I joined the baseball team, and I had to be a leader immediately. I was probably the youngest, but one of the most experienced kids on the team. Um, and yes, I lost my cool, but that's just kind of what happens when you play Burke sports for seven years. <laughs> um, but it was basketball that helped me the most, because although I often led in the field and in the gym, I was certainly the worst on the varsity team my freshman year, and probably still in my senior year. So I had to listen. I listened to what Adam Poole had said in practice. I did what Jarrell Johnson did on the court. And I followed in these slightly larger footsteps of Daniel Green. And it was listening and learning for those first three years that gave me the confidence to take on that very same leadership role my senior year. And I did just that, leading our team to a whopping three wins. <laughs> Lastly, something that both Burke and my parents taught me is that fortune favors the bold. But what I now understand is that boldness is actually confidence. Before my sophomore year, I always thought that doing something new, something I was nervous about, would only lead to embarrassment. But I couldn't have been more wrong. Whether it be asking questions in class, or being brave enough to go up and introduce myself to CeeLo Green in the restaurant, true story. Um, I learned that good things will happen as long as you have confidence in yourself. So, I want to thank Burke. This school taught me not only how to ask those difficult questions in the world and in the classroom, um, and also how to engage in those difficult conversations. It has taught me how to lead, how to be led, how to listen, but also how to be heard. But most importantly, it taught me how to be confident. So again, thank you to everyone and everything that made that a possibility for me. Thank you for giving a short kid the confidence to stand tall. And lastly, I'd like to extend the congratulations to the class of 2019. I couldn't be happier to have been a part of Burke's 50th class of seniors right alongside you all. Thank you all very much. Welcome parents, family, friends, faculty, staff, alumni, and trustees to Evan Burke School's commencement ceremony for the class of 2019. I want to thank you for being here today to celebrate the accomplishments of our graduates. And I want to thank you for all the support you have provided our students over the years in guiding them toward graduation. Your dedication to the lives of your children has been integral to their success. And your commitment to Burke has enabled us to foster a learning environment informed by our mission to consciously bring together a diverse group of students and to actively foster their growth, development, and their growth and development as independent thinkers. Throughout the course of their study and life experience at Burke, today's graduates have gained great knowledge, valuable skills, and abilities, as well as a sense of responsibility and commitment to justice that will enable them to make positive contributions in the world in which we live. At Burke, we remain committed to maintaining a unique school community that believes that students should be diverse in ethnicity, family structure, gender identity, political perspective, race, religion, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status. This diversity is and will continue to be our schools and our students' greatest strength. The heterogeneity of our community expands the lived experience of our students and it increases their capacity to more nimbly and critically engage in a world that is becoming more increasingly diverse. Given all that our graduates have gained from Burke, their experiences would not be possible without the care of our talented faculty and staff. I'm grateful for their faithful and steadfast commitment to ensuring that every student in the school is well known and that every student feels meaningfully supported and included in the life of our school. At this time, I'd like to ask our graduates to stand to applaud our faculty and staff as an expression of their thanks for all that they've done to nurture you over the years.
and to our graduates. I appreciate all that you've done to influence and uphold our school's mission and culture through your leadership and maintaining an environment that has been welcoming, kind, respectful, inclusive, equitable, and supportive of all community members. Throughout your time at Burke, you have been encouraged Throughout your time at Burke, you've encouraged others to strive towards excellence through the consistent demonstration of your impressive intellectual strengths, your exciting creative talents, and your notable athletic abilities. It is clear to me that you are imaginative, curious, thoughtful, collaborative, courageous, active, and responsible, and that you are ready to formulate the vital questions of your time, discover the essential answers, and arrive at your own informed judgments as individuals eager to actively engage in the world. Class of 2019, please continue to be your authentic selves. You are at your best when you do this. And please continue to welcome others to do the same by encouraging differences of opinions, ideas, interests, expressions, and identities. And I urge you to courageously declare the worth of others and to stand firm in challenging behaviors that demean, marginalize, and exclude people, and above all else, do the just and the right thing. As you enter life beyond high school, I'm reminded of words written by our school's namesake, Edmund Burke, who wrote, never despair, but if you do, work on in despair. And he went on to write, no one can make a greater mistake than he or she who did nothing because he or she could do only a little. These words will resonate with you over time because you will learn that life can be hard and that challenges will inevitably present themselves. However, despite how difficult a moment may be and despite the despair that you will encounter, you have to fully embrace life and the struggles that you face along the way and you have to and you must press on in the face of it all. You have to believe even when you think you have little to give, that your actions, no matter how small, have the power to affect change. And you shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that because you can only do a little, that nothing should be done at all. Instead, you have to maintain ongoing faith and remain steadfast in your ability to make a difference in the world. It's also important to remember that life is a team sport and that no one is capable of greatness without help, support, mentorship, and encouragement from others. Your ability to exercise flexibility, creativity, openness, collaboration, and conflict resolution are essential for keeping up in the 21st century. Furthermore, your success in the world is going to be as much determined by your ability to work with others as it is by your intellectual capabilities. So to be, so to be clear, your ability to achieve any level of success is highly dependent upon your capacity to effectively engage those around you in the work you'll be doing throughout the rest of your life. So it is important to continue to be good friends. It's important to be trustworthy partners. It's important to be dependable colleagues. And above all else, it is important to treat one another and every other person in your life with respect, and kindness and with a commitment to be equitable, inclusive, and to be just. Class of 2019, I stand here in admiration of each and every one of you, and I'm joined by so many in recognition of you today for all that you have done for Burke and all that you will do in the exciting and robust futures that lie ahead of you in the wider world. I wish you the very best on this day, your day. Congratulations, class of 2019. Can't pull myself, don't want nobody else to ever love me. You are my shining star, my guide, and I'm a love fantasy. There's not a minute, hour, day, or night that I don't love you. You're at the top of my list, cause I'm always thinking of you. I still remember in the days when I was scared to touch you. How I spent my day dreaming, planning how to say I love you. You must have known that I had feelings deep enough to swim in. That's when you opened your heart and you told me to come in. Oh my love, I'm a million kisses. 
pieces from you is never too much And I just don't wanna stop Oh my love A million days in your arms is never too much And I just don't wanna stop Oh my love A million days in your arms is never enough And I just don't wanna stop Woke up to say that your picture just took and they started I called you up, you weren't been there when I was broken hearted up the phone, delay the process so demanding, open the door, and to my surprise that you were standing, who needs to work for the hustle burn at the dark, I'd rather be with you, you and my legs came in harder, now there's a gamble and I'm so glad that I am winning, you come along with it, only this is the beginning, oh my Supporting me through everything. 
when I got to Judah, there was stuff with the rock, and they helped me get through it. When Kelly or Alexis have noticed me be seeming upset over something, they checked in with me and helped me find somewhere to catch my breath. Chris has stopped in the hallway to talk to me for 10 minutes about my plans for the future, and Gina met with me for 45 minutes to help me with my college decision. All of these teachers have supported me, not because it is their job, because this was all outside of the classroom, classwork and grades, but because they really care. And I don't know anywhere else where there are quite so many people that genuinely care. <laughs> Growing up for my whole life, I wanted to be a teacher. Because of this, I always looked up to my teachers and had so much admiration and respect for them. I want to thank all of my teachers I've had ever for being such amazing role models as teachers and as people. <sighs> Lastly, I want to take a moment to reflect on specifically the other members of this graduating class. <sighs> they too have all been so kind and supportive and caring in so many ways. Whether it be someone I talk to every day, all the time, or someone who I've hardly got a class with for all of high school. If I've been upset about something or just having a bad day, I've had so many people check in with me, which has meant more than I could ever express. I mean, I've always wanted to get up to go to school in the morning, but overall, it really has been such an amazing experience being at work, surrounded by so many great people. And I can truly say in all honesty that every single person in this class has made my time at work some better in some way. So thank you all for that. Thank you for listening, and thank you, teachers and students, for your events care these past four and seven years for some of us. Thank you. Welcome, graduates, faculty and staff, family, and friends. My first three memories of work are as such. One, sitting on the car floor of the atrium while I and the tiger fasted, and Kelly Phillips excitedly clapped as students were pie during the pie day assembly, which happened to be on my shadow day thinking, where am I? <laughs> Two, meeting only Joe in the freshman commons for the first time, which resulted in my slow motion fall backwards as I went to stand back up from petting her due to the unfortunate physics of a heavy backpack, not enough core strength, and Corgi's proximity to the floor. <laughs> Three, later in the year, during grade meeting, my chair fell into the space between the bleachers. My chair quickly became a plastic Venus flytrap, and I became the fly. <laughs> so you could say that freshman year was not doing any favors for my dignity. However, there was one exception to that, Berg Sports. While I was swimming in the questionably sanitary UDC pool at 7 a.m. on a Monday morning, <laughs> or jogging to the softball field as One Direction played, shockingly not at my request, I was creating friendships, memories, and self-confidence. And I stand up here today because I know that whether it's through sports, arts, or academics, every graduating senior has left work a more confident person than when they began. Now we have this moment, our moment, to reflect on how we have grown through our work career. Think of your personal growth as a pyramid, like the food charts they print on plastic plates. At the base, we have our family, the people who have been our constant support system. Without our families, we cannot be here today. They are our guideposts for everything and the base we stand on. Next, we have our mentors, teachers, coaches, and advisors who have pushed us to be the best versions of ourselves because they can see our potential. Climbing further up our pyramid, we have our friends. Whether they've been your best friend since sixth grade or your lab partner in science, we all have someone who's there for us when we need to laugh, cry, or just sit on your phone together in silence. These friendships have given us joy, laughter, and happy memories that we will take with us into the faux adulthood that is college. <laughs> now we have arrived. <laughs> the top of the pyramid. The compass that orients towards the sun. Us. As we stand here on the top of our pyramid and look down at the experiences and people who have allowed us this vantage point, recall the immortal words of Miley Cyrus as Hannah Montana in the song The Climb. It's not about how we get there or about what's waiting on the other side. It's all about the climb. This summit we stand on is not the only we will reach in our lifetimes. It is only the beginning. And the others may be taller, with fewer footholds in dangerous conditions, but we keep climbing. We keep climbing because we are ready. We have the tools, we have the confidence, and we have the drive. Next fall, we will enter as freshmen and look up at our new mountains and know that the people here today will be saying well done when we reach the top. <laughs> Normal is boring. 
Example, a clinic presidency. <laughs> there's no reason to do something normal, just as there's no reason not to want to do something normal. Normal sort of this equilibrium in life that's a sign that you're perfectly min-maxing your existence. Burke is not normal. <laughs> Burke's a bit like Florida in a sense. <laughs> you don't go to Florida expecting things to be normal. You go to Florida to see, and I quote, a Florida man use matrix moves to dodge a swarm of love bugs. In the same breath, you don't go to Burke to see to see normal, you, see, you go to see people from completely different backgrounds exchange experiences and share in a high school journey that wouldn't be possible anywhere else. And I wouldn't want to be anywhere else, but here truly and honestly, because at birth, everything's just a little bit amazing. <laughs> I say that to say, we currently live in a time where indifference is normal, uh, due to the immediacy and availability of information and the bombardment of entertainment that we've been saturated with, we find ourselves as the generation where whatever is in front of us isn't ever going to be as magnificent as whatever is in our screens. Yet I still find myself looking at my classmates in amazement, musically, artistically, and athletically. I know that I can listen to any song I've played in band on my phone, I know that it'll sound perfect every time, but I'd still rather go and learn to play with my friends and perform and perhaps not to the quality of the studio session, uh, but to be able to share it with my school truly makes it worthwhile. In other places, cynicism has this habit of winning out. The world's only become more jaded with time. Yet the way this class supports each other goes beyond what we've come to expect from the world. I'm far from a connoisseur of art, yet as I fail to understand the musings of Andy Warhol and I drift to sleep at the whispers of Bob Ross, I'm at attention when producing my classmates' artwork. Don't get me wrong, I still fail to understand it, but, <laughs> but the attention and detail and the time clearly put in, as well as the vision required to make a piece from scratch is amazing to me. We go above and beyond. Let me tell you a secret. I don't like musicals. <laughs> My suspension of disbelief ends when people try to sing through their problems. <laughs> anticipating the next one. It's obviously not the music, it's the kinship that comes with rehearsing for months on end, perfecting every song or every note to a song to perform it only a couple of weekends and then never again. However, you still remain close to the cast with whom you've shared the experience and you're always thankful to your friends who show up. And in other place it'd be easy to write off a musical as corny, but here it's something special that the whole community, and especially my grade, has made a cornerstone of the school year as well as a centerpiece to many high school experiences. I feel as though we represent something unique. We're living at a time where progress is at a premium and aggression appears to be a new trend. It's easy to find an overwhelming sense of dread, but it's not as easy to get a grasp on the reality of the world we live in. And with the situation we find ourselves in, when a positive appears, it's easy to dismiss it as a fluke. If hope was a stop, it would be plummeting right now. <laughs> Yet, when I look at my grade, and I think back to all we've done, I think back to all we can do, I have hope. Thank you. Greetings, grandparents, parents, friends, colleagues, on this glorious day and a most grateful welcome to this exemplary class of 2019. As a species, we have been writing stories for 4,000 years or so, but we've been telling them for much longer. As soon as the guttural noises turned into words, we gathered around the fire and told tales. It's who we are. The oldest written story is the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh, an amazing piece of literature chiseled onto 11 stone tablets. It begins with the city, with a description of the city of Uruk and its tyrant king, Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is so arrogant, so destructive, so terrible, that his own priests are forced to appeal to the gods for some kind of remedy. So, the gods fashion a creature, a wild man, who will in time temper Gilgamesh and help him. His name is Enkidu. He shows up to Uruk 
wrestles Gilgamesh to a stalemate, and the two become fast friends. And so, literature's first bromance comes to define the middle of the narrative. The two go on crazy adventures, but soon become bored. And boredom, then as now, often inspires bad ideas. Gilgamesh decides that they should kill Humbaba, a peaceful guardian of the cedar forest, just for kicks. So they do, and the gods punish them by sickening Enkidu, who eventually dies a slow, unheroic death. This loss tortures Gilgamesh and leads to the epic's final third. Our hero's sorrow is great, but he's actually more troubled by the fact that he too might die. And so he soon departs to find the immortal survivor of the great flood, the Noah, a thousand years before the biblical one, Utana Pishtim. Who else could possess the secret of immortality? Gilgamesh eventually finds it. At the end of the world is given directions to a lake somewhere, at the bottom of which there is a magic weed that will grant Gilgamesh what he wishes. So he finds it. He swims to the bottom of the lake, finds the weed, but he's so exhausted when he gets back up to the shore that he falls asleep. Then a snake slithers by and steals the weed. Just like that. Gilgamesh wakes, is devastated, returns home. The epic ends with him gazing at the majestic gates of his city and realizing that life is pretty exceptional. It's a truly beautiful story. And plot aside, what's perhaps most compelling about the epic of Gilgamesh is that it established the very framework we use to tell stories. Across time and cultures, we are unified in this. And this framework is universal. It belongs to no specific group of people. There is a pattern, a comfortable and comforting process that brings us together. From those early campfires to classrooms today, the themes are rich and resonant throughout eons. And their richness deepens because of the familiar scaffolding that holds them together. Okay, so we know how stories are built, but it's more interesting to pursue the question of why we tell them in the first place. And Gilgamesh definitely acts as a perfect starting place on the quest to that answer. At its core, it's a story about our fear of death, or the unknown, sure, but it's also so much deeper than that. In our first story, we explore the futility of seeking immortality so that we can come to the conclusion that life is beautiful and that it's only the finite quality of our existence that gives life any meaning at all. These old tales resonate because of their emotional depth and understanding. Take Beowulf. <laughs> it's not just a collection of action-packed monster killings. Well, it is, but Beowulf himself begins his heroism because he grew weary of being thought of as a less than. He had the audacity to possess great sensitivity. And only in the end does that manifest as heroic and worthy of emulation. What all stories allow us as readers and as people is an opportunity for empathy and from a comfortably safe distance. But. It's that distance that opens the door for the young reader's mistaken belief that since it's just a story, the themes explored don't matter so much, not like they would in real life. But stories are a reflection of real life, of course. We all know that. We all know that like we know our own hearts or our families. We witness in the suffering of fictional characters potential seeds of our own despair even our own destruction. We empathize because we also comprehend that things break, that things fall apart, that we are not always our best selves, or even approximate projections of the people we so desperately wish to be. 
Like a Gokuo, we fear the new and the uncertainty that comes from clinging to our traditions. Like Edna on Tillier, we have all woken up one morning and thought, this isn't me. We are at various times Hamlet, Piggy, or Hester Prynne. Burdened as we are by both our own anxieties and frailties, and by the ways in which we are perceived by others. So then, the answer to why we tell stories has to do with connection. When we are young, we often look at stories as a kind of escapist dreamscape, a place where there exists no hurt, no anger, no disease, no heartbreak. But you know it's much more than that. Storytelling and reading, they are the self asserting itself into the larger structure that has been human history for all memory. There is indeed a universal humanity that reading allows us to tap into. It's quite lovely, really, to feel this connection, to know that we're all like wired to tell stories and to receive them. Yes, the very reciprocity of storytelling connects us all. This means then that disconnection is a choice. A conscious moving away from others and those things that bring us together. We see now, perhaps more than ever, the ills that come from this choice. A choice to see and exploit perceived differences instead of celebrating those many things we have in common. Now as you move from this place to some other, your story is about to change. And it will be your choices that come to define the story of that transition. And you must ask, you owe it to yourself to ask, is there a right way to tell this story? Well, it turns out there is. You see, we are what we do. It's that simple. Those things we believe, that we value, that we think and feel, they only matter if they inspire our actions in the world, are reflected in them. Your lives as readers prepared you to appreciate the value of empathy, of kindness, and of compassion. The suffering of fictional characters has awakened in you the ability to truly see and combat the mechanisms that create real-world real world suffering all around you. We are what we do. And to live in a truly authentic fashion is to make sure that we take responsibility for what we do. And while acknowledging our own moments of goodness and purity is easy enough on our hearts, we will miss that on occasion, giving in to personal desires at the expense of others. And the recovery from that is also part of the universal connection we all share. The philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre said that every moment is either one of transcendence or a falling off of opportunity. At first, that sounds dreadful and frightening. Really? Each and every moment is measured in that fashion? Everything is so fraught, so big? Well, yes, but also no. A falling off of opportunity. A missed chance, really. But one from which we can recover. For that falling off, it just leads to another moment. Our mistakes, our broken promises, our lies, our paralysis from grief, these are only catastrophic if we don't let them lead to a greater understanding, greater openness. That transcendence is what Sartre speaks of. You have learned so much in your time at Burke, and that connection that you have made with each other and with us are but the starting threads in the web you will weave in the universe. So go now, engage with the world with authenticity, compassion, and grace. Be better than what you see. Own and honor your choices at every moment as best you can. Choose to transcend. Congratulations. Last year. Here's the part I've been waiting for all year. As 12th grade dean, I get to give you your last words of wisdom from the Edmund Burke School. I promise you I will not misuse this privilege. So here goes. Before you go out into the world, I want you to reflect on one thing that almost every speaker who stood up here said about you. How much you all care for one another. You have shown in your years at Burke, whether it's been seven, six, 
four, two, however long you've been here, immense depths of compassion and empathy. You have shown each other to be true friends to one another and a constant source of support. The world is going to need more people exactly like you. So what I would love for you to do is to go out into that world, be the best you can be, be the best scientist, the best activist, the best musician, the best lawyer, the best whatever you choose to do in your professional or artistic capacities, but in your personal lives, never stop being the wonderful friends and family members each of you all are. The faculty and staff have gotten to work with you over a number of years. You have told us about how much we need to you. What we don't get to do is tell you how much you need to us. So on behalf of all the members of the faculty and staff at Emmett Bird School, we're going to miss you very much. Come on, please rise. Please turn around and face your family.